Hello everyone, it's Irene Lyon here and welcome to this live chat with me. If you're watching this right now, you're probably taking in the recording because in this forum of Facebook and social media, it takes a little time for people to pop on, but I will start um, teaching and talking and giving you a little overview, review of what's happening right now. Um, it is February, 2020 and we are in the registration period for my flagship program smart body smart mind and this is a nervous system rewire program it teaches you us how to become our own medicine and really to apprentice our nervous system get into knowing how to work with it how to make it more regulated more resilient how to restore our entire physiology so it is a comprehensive curriculum that we have been running well over five years now this is going to be in 2020 the ninth time so this will be the ninth time we have run smart body smart mind and it is a stellar way to really just sink in and learn what we are not taught in the general world in school and even in health um, trainings so um, oops just kicked my desk there so smart body smart mind it's open for enrollment right now we run this starting on march 2nd which is a monday and registration is open until the first of march which is a sunday so i'm just going to get over here into the comments if you're watching this live on youtube um, or I should say the recording on YouTube. Thank you for popping in. Um, we put these recordings up on the YouTube channel as well so people can watch this if they are not on Facebook. I have got questions, many questions right here and right here. We had calls last week and I didn't get to all of them. So I'm gonna get into some of these questions. And um, my hands are a little cold, so I'm gonna put the sweater over myself just so I can stay warm here. Um, hello, Elizabeth from Rhode Island. Where is everybody else calling from today or coming in from? I'd love to know, so let me know in the comments. Um, and the other thing I'll mention too is this is the only time we run Smart Body, Smart Mind, SBSM, this year in 2020 we only run it once a year so know that the next time we open up enrollment um, after we close our registration on the first of march will be next year next year 2021 so if you know you would like to work with me and really work at this nervous system level and heal trauma at the somatic level this is the time to get in hey there from napa hello from new jersey Hello from Arizona. Hello from Nanaimo. That's just behind me here across the water. Um, so I'm going to head into some of these questions. And what we'll start to see and what you'll start to learn is that many of these questions have the same answer. If not all of them have the same answer. And maybe just ask yourself the question, why would that be? And if you haven't yet started my healing trauma video training it's a three-part training that is live right now if you want to join this if you haven't joined this please do so because i get into the real science and the sources of trauma what trauma really is how it gets stuck in our body um, and what it takes to heal at this level i get into how when we are living in survival mode fight flight and freeze when that's running the front of our bus or it's, it's running our ship, to use those metaphors, it impacts our entire system, not just specific organ systems, everything. And so when we have excess fight, flight, and freeze governing our physiology, usually it's due, if not all the time, due to unresolved traumatic stress from early in life, in utero, even generational trauma and shock traumas that occur as we are adults and older, when we have got these things circling through our um, system, the stress physiology and these reactivities to the environment and this perception that there's a threat, even when there really isn't a threat there, when we live that way, it impacts not just our nervous system, but all of the organ systems, all of the behavioral systems, relational, how we connect to our body, how we sleep at night, how we parent our children, how we do our work, how we use our higher brain, 
that survival stress impacts everything. I'll just land on that for a moment. So when we are healing our systems, and if someone, and I'm going to be talking about autoimmune, mental illness, sleep, um, intergenerational trauma, today in these questions, when we have got unresolved traumatic stress and we are having these symptoms in current life, the goal is to restore regulation and more resiliency and more, the, the, the fancy word is capacity to the nervous system and the entire organism. And in video number one of that healing trauma series, I don't wanna repeat myself because it's there ready for you to watch after this Q&A call. Um, in that video, and maybe let me know if you've watched these videos, if you're watching live, I go into the analogy of the swimming pool and beach balls. And it is one of the best ways I have found to explain how traumatic stress gets stored in our system and how it impacts everything. So, Thanks everybody for being here. Hey from Boulder, Scotland. Um, Yona asks, are there many, many Feldenkrais practitioners in your program? There are definitely um, quite a few. I don't know the exact numbers. Um, we don't gather those stats, but we have many Feldenkrais practitioners, many body workers, um, Pilates instructors, teachers, occupational therapists, psychotherapists, moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, um, I don't limit who I talk to and let, allow into the program because what we're really after is restoring health to the system. And for people to do that, they have to want to do it and they have to want to really learn this language of the nervous system. The Feldenkrais practitioners that I do know, Yona, who have gone into this work, many of them have studied um, more deeply, like I have, the fields of somatic experiencing and somatic practice. Um, and all of them will say that their entire practice is revolutionized when they learn this because we're working at that nervous system level when we work with the Feldenkrais method. Um, and Moshe's work, in my opinion, wasn't complete when he died. And so my sense is the reason why our colleagues or my colleagues in that field are doing so well with their practices and able to help people at a deeper level is because they have this underbelly, if you will, of how the autonomic nervous system might be stuck in survival mode. And that's how I got into this work. I was working in private practice with Feldenkrais and about half of my clients weren't getting better with what helped me when I got into the work. And um, it was clear that the reason the Feldenkrais work wasn't sticking, and I'll speak to that for a moment right now, it wasn't sticking because that work is highly advanced. It requires more differentiation more what we call regulation in the system because it's higher brain work. It's really demanding that a person uh, feel and sense and be alert to very small distinct movement patterns and then change and shift them with a regulated sense of self. And many people go into sessions with Feldenkrais practitioners and classes and their system is revving so high that they can't even take in the higher level learning of the Feldenkrais method. And so this is where the stages of neuroplastic healing are very important. And I have my handout here in video number three. This is the handout for video number three. In video number three of the Healing Trauma series, I call it the unorthodox healing blueprint and what it takes to really heal. There's one essential piece that I talk about and that is the power of neuroplastic healing sequencing. We can't start, um, I used the example the other day in another call, we can't start doing differential calculus when we're learning math and how to count. We have to start with even knowing what a number is and the basics of one, two, three, one plus one equals two, et cetera. Um, and so, going right into the Feldenkrais work, in my opinion, and from what I've seen professionally, when we have got unresolved survival stress and traumatic experiences still coursing through our veins, if we try to do the Feldenkrais work or more advanced forms of, say, meditation, it would be like asking a, a five-year-old to do differential calculus and they don't even know how to count. And so we're feeling, we're seeing, I'm seeing, my colleagues are seeing this 
it's like a bit of a friction right now in some of the more advanced mind body methods. They're all very valid. And I teach Feldenkrais in my workshops and I teach Feldenkrais within the programs and smart body, smart mind. We, we teach quite a fair bit, but we, we gather and we build foundation and we introduce it in a small way so that when we get to the higher level learning, the system is ready for that kind of challenge, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. So we structure it and titrate the learning so that we're basically putting people into a situation so they succeed when they do these more differentiated lessons. So that was a long way of saying, uh, yes, there are definitely Feldenkrais practitioners within my programs. Um, and many of them go on to study more in depth with me um, or they decide to do more specific trauma training um, so that they can work also with traumatic events in their practice. Hello from the Netherlands. Hello from Denmark. Hello from Canada. Hello, Ingrid. I think you're bolder. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, Yona. Yes, you cannot put the cart before the horse. It won't get anywhere. Okay, I'm going to get into here with these questions. Um, so this is from Cheryl, and she asks, you said something in a recent talk that piqued my interest but didn't elaborate, and I found myself curious about this and wanted some more info. So although most of this work is done on a somatic level, you mentioned something about the mind being involved as well. I've often heard of the somatic work as bottom up and work done on the mind being top down. I've always thought that it is helpful to have both of these working in conjunction, although I often find most people who deal with trauma tend to focus on the body in the somatic approach. I'm curious what kind of work from the mind or brain top down would be helpful for healing trauma. So here's what's interesting about here. This is, and I, I steal this answer from one of my mentors, uh, Peter Levine, who is the is and was is the founder of Somatic Experiencing, and he really put on the map the fact that traumatic stress is stored in the body, in the physiology, and if we don't work with that body-based level, um, we aren't completing the whole picture of trauma resolution. And a lot of the earlier therapies, psychoanalysis, for example, or talk therapy, um, also known as CBT, they're about talking and explaining and rehashing events and, and, and tears and crying, more cathartic release. And we often see those as top down, meaning we're, we're driving by it, by the, the, the thoughts, um, I, I like to say thoughts and thinking because our mind, we still don't know where that actually lives in the human brain. So thoughts, thinking, cognitive uh, comprehension, if you will. We think of that as top down. We then look at things like yoga or Feldenkrais or um, a somatic experiencing even, and it's called that's a bottom up approach. And Peter has actually corrected people and said, no, 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 that is not correct. We have to have both. And when you really study the work of Peter Levine and you get into, say, the work that I teach in Smart Body, Smart Mind, we're never not allowing a person to notice their thoughts when they're connecting with their body. For example, we're always layering in the elements of awareness because if we don't, we're not restoring the whole organism back to its full function. And humans have this higher brain, right? Everyone say hello to your higher brain. I encourage you to play with me when I do these movements, right? You've got this prefrontal cortex that is so intelligent, so intelligent. And then we have this gut and brain stem and our kidneys and adrenals and our amygdala and all the parts of our brain that go into danger mode without us having to tell it to go into danger mode. And so that is this we would call it bottom-up approach. It's a spontaneous automatic situation. If I take a drink of this tea, which I will, I don't have to think through the digestive process to absorb water, etc. So when we work with trauma and we want to work with it really well, 
which is what I do and teach my students, we have to acknowledge all of it. And I do this movement with my hand. So it's like the top is here and the bottom is here and we're constantly doing this, right? It's actually quite soothing to do this. So it's like we're having this top inform the bottom and we're having the bottom inform the top. And if we don't have the higher brain, the thinking, the cognition there for reason, we may feel a trigger response in our body. We may experience some form of um, abruptness in our physiology. And if we can't turn on our higher brain and have it be there all the time to witness what's happening, our physiology can go off the charts and we end up recreating a traumatic experience from just feeling a sensation. And so we need to have that higher brain and our thought process to observe. And in some ways it's like talking to ourselves to say, is this really something to get really um, elevated with, aroused with, activated with? And that's where the thoughts and the, the mind, if we want to call it that, although I don't prefer that, but the thoughts can help, where our higher brain can help us, where we can choose with our higher brain um, a different course of action, right? I'm feeling really activated right now. It might make sense for me to not keep pushing and to pause and feel, and as I say this, you guys can do this with me, feel the ground under me and know, oh, it's actually there, right? And just that tiny shift in perception or, oh, there's a beautiful blue sky outside. Isn't that amazing? And it refocuses the attention on that, let's say, stress response. And when we're learning for the first time how to be with our stress responses, sometimes it takes, if not most of the time, it takes an active participating cognitive thought process where you are actually talking to yourself and saying, I'm going to look outside right now and I'm going to connect to the ground under me. I might say hello to my body because I've disconnected from it. I might feel my breath. So to come back to this question, Cheryl, you say I tend to live in my head, so I find the somatic approach helpful but yet my mind seems to have a certain amount of information for me to buy in. You're right. So it's all about knowing that we need both. We cannot get rid of our thoughts. And I don't mean that um, in the sense that we cannot clear our mind of thoughts, but we want to have our brain working, right? We want to have this witness to be there to say to us, hey, that's not such a big deal, or hey, this is a big deal and then to listen to the somatic self so that we know how to take a course of action. So bottom up, top down, they go together. And I think where we've gotten into trouble, I don't think I know, in this whole mind, body, healing, trauma, self-help industry, if we want to call it that, is we have these specific spaces. It's like this is for working with the body and this is for working with the mind. Oh, and then we take care of our gut by eating well, and we take care of our immune system by overdosing on vitamin C, and we do all these things that are separate. And while those are useful at times, we want to bring them all together, right? Um, and so, I mean, I was just thinking about this the other day. There's a lot of people are always saying, oh, read, uh, listen to audiobooks when you're walking, listen to podcasts or do this when you're just cleaning up the house and, and as a way to distract yourself or to get in that reading or to get in that education. And then they say, and then you should have a sitting meditation practice so that you can then be with your body and be with your mind and clear everything out. And I say, well, why not go for that walk without listening to something? Why not clean the house and just be in the cleaning? Why not have the meditation and the body-based somatic connections just be all the time to me me talking to you is a somatic process it is a form of meditation if you will i'm just speaking and i'm very aware of my physiology and your energy um, and so i think we just have to get more um holistic i know we use that word a lot but holistic um we need to bring it all together okay 
I'm going to come back to our comments here. Ingrid asks, does the same apply to trying to visualize health and practices that only seem to cause a stress response in my system? Too high a brain function my for, too high of a brain function for my dysregulated system at this time, most likely. Yeah, and again, it comes down to how much can we visualize and then do we stop? Again, there's this thing where we have to like do it for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And if you don't, if you don't meditate for 30 minutes a day, because that's what the research says, then you might as well not do it. But for some people, they can't stay, they can't have that level of focus and attention for 30 minutes, but maybe they can for 30 seconds. That is really important. I go back to the, the, the children, the kids. It's like if, you're, if your new uh, child who's starting to read can't read through the whole book, is, does that mean that it's not useful to just do one page, right? And we have this thought that we have to complete things in order for us to have gotten it right. And I think a lot of that is because of our school system. Um, but, you know, do a little bit, visualize a little bit and do it in a way that is maybe not as focused, but more has a different kind of visualization. Again, there's lots of ways to talk about this, but I won't go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, okay. Hey, Haley, you're from Sydney. Hello. Um, you signed up for your first round of SPSM. Awesome. Um, professionally, you're a social worker and you have complex trauma, so I'm really looking forward to healing. So thank you for um, commenting. What symptoms have you heard it benefits? What symptoms have you heard it benefits? Some of mine include hypervigilance, insomnia, food intolerance, and low immunity. I'm not sure if there's a question in there, but everything you wrote, hypervigilance, insomnia, food intolerance, and low immunity, I have seen those exact things be improved, if not completely healed within SBSM. Everyone is different, but as I mentioned at the beginning, the fight flight survival response is when we're bathed in those chemicals and our system is going off 24 seven looking for danger or it's shut down and kind of despondent and no longer interested in protection. Um, our gut, our immune system, our ability to rest, our ability to see the world and be calm about it, it shifts and changes. And so when we work at this somatic level with the nervous system, all those pieces, all those pieces, they improve. And how they improve and the timing in which they improve is very independent of each person. Everyone's going to be really different. Um, I'm going to get back to one more question here on my pieces of paper. This is from Kirsty, And you said, you say, um, I, I'm hesitant to join the program for the following reasons, and this is totally normal. Um, at the same time, I want to be the healthiest I can be and feel the best I can feel, um, and I'd be grateful if you can address some of these questions. So it looks like you have had burnout for about 14 years, anxiety, panic attacks, um, and you're not aware of any big traumatic childhood events. I have, however, been highly sensitive and codependent um, basically I'm a tense controlling perfectionist. Thank you for your honesty with a lot of fear and I feel unsafe in my body. And is your program for something as general as yes, 100% yes, yes, yes. So I, I want to address this because this is really important. Um, typically we don't have massive traumatic events. Now there are many people who do. But what I've seen, what we've seen is by the by, a lot of these things that you write about here, Kirsty, so tense, controlling, highly sensitive, anxiety, those can be created, those show up from really subtle micro traumas. And a lot of them can be just general ways in which we have culturized and conditioned human animals, right? So children not being able to express themselves, that, that idea children should be seen and not heard, um, sleep training, uh, allowing babies to cry it out so they go to sleep, that highly impacts the nervous system physiology and renders them into a state of terror and panic. And while we don't remember that, because it happened when we were really little, our somatic physiology does remember that stuff. Um, 
if parents don't like each other, if they stay together for the kids and there's this constant tension and feuding. Um, so there doesn't have to be physical or sexual or environmental traumas. It can be something as subtle as mom and dad not getting along, them not knowing how to express their own emotions. And then we take that on. And a common thing for those that would label and call themselves highly sensitive is that there will be usually a history of the child and even the infant and the teenager knowing that if they are not very controlled and very hyper vigilant with the surroundings, they risk getting in trouble or they get ri they risk being shouted at or maybe physically abused. Um, and so what happens, because we're super smart as humans because of this higher brain, is we will change our behavior we will change our internal physiology so that we stay safe. And then what occurs is we stop expressing our needs. We stop emoting our emotions. We stop feeling our body um, and we stop being who we're supposed to be. There's this concept that we have a personality and um, our kind of life force energy or, or our individuality and our personalities get formed usually based on what we had to cope with and survive with when we were young. Now this could be due to the parents, the environment, it could be due to the school system, um, but usually it's the home life. It could also be due to, let's say a child, uh, an infant was born premature and they had to be put in an incubator and they had to have surgeries and tubes and strangers poking at them to keep them alive. That is highly traumatic and stressful, but a lot of times we don't make that connection to, oh gosh, well, I was being saved, which is true, and it was also a very scary experience for that little organism that is immature and doesn't know how to regulate their physiology. So yes, um, everything you wrote here is exactly what people come into this program for. Um, and there are people who have written and talked about how they've changed their sensitivities. They can eat more foods. They are not reacting if they have a glass of wine, for example. They can start eating gluten again. So a lot of these um, allergies and intolerances that we're seeing, it's a result of the immune system being either hyper or dampened, and then it impacts what we bring into our body. But when we get out of our survival physiology and we start to heal, um, the system isn't in that kind of attack mode or dampened mode. It just does what it needs to do. Not to say that there aren't real true allergies that people have. That's, that's different. Um, so yes, and can your program reset general health in a way that could also balance hormone levels um, and undo damage from years of anxiety? 100%. So again, if we take a step back, if you think of this entire body system of ours, the hormones are excreted based on the health of the nervous system. And so when the nervous system has been pumping out stress chemicals to protect and to stay safe, um, our metabolism shifts, our hormonal system shifts, it is in survival mode all the time. And so this classic um, way of talking about say burnout or overwhelm or adrenal fatigue, it is also something that will heal and shift and change when we get under and work at the somatic nervous system level. Um, and then your next question, Kirstie, your questions are so great and they're gonna to apply to everyone, so I'm just gonna go through them. Um, you also say I'm a huge procrastinator. Yes, um, and you believe that this is based in anxiety. It's based in survival, right? So when we are, again, living in that soup of survival stress, our higher brain, our cognitive planning brain, our behavior-based actions aren't that favorable. They're not very helpful. And so procrastination, having a lot of resistance, not being able to move forward in life, those are all, all signs, I should say, of untreated early traumatic stress. In the second video, let me get my hand out here. If you haven't watched the Healing Drama series, the untreated trauma, the signs, sources, and science. I talk about that exact thing. This is why I'm on you guys to watch these videos. The very first thing, first, oh, 
the first sign is resistance, right? So again, when we have been stopped in our tracks as little human beings and we've had to micromanage what we do to stay safe, whether it's in body or in mind or even in spirit, our natural desire to move forward is going to be stunted. And so part of unlocking this resistance and procrastination is to, it, it helps to move ourselves forward. I'm thinking about someone that I worked with ages ago when I first started practicing. She was quite young and we worked on, um, I can't remember exactly what, but I was teaching her how to reconnect with her environment, reconnect with her body. And after only one, I think week, and she was quite young. She was, I think in her twenties and still living at home. She spontaneously cleaned her room and she had not ever done that ever without having to be asked by her mom or dad. And I thought that is amazing because she was no longer living in the survival physiology um, in that moment of doing the practices I was teaching her. And she could actually connect with her system, see her room and be like, this is a mess and actively behave to take charge and power to clean up her environment. Um, so yes, procrastination is something that can be shifted with this. Um, and then you have a question about an autoimmune condition. It's the same thing. So again, everyone's going to be different. And I do believe in the medical system when it can work for us. So if there is an actual condition and I won't go into the condition you have here, but it's an eye condition. Um, we have to think about this immune system is part of all of this that I'm talking about. So when we again are driven by survival physiology, our immune system is either going to be extra, like it's gonna, go, it's gonna attack the system or it's gonna be flatlined. And this has to do with the, with the hormone, the chemical cortisol. And so when we have got a lot of stress, we're pumping out, pumping out cortisol and that can cause the system to basically have tissues break down. It is toxic to the system. It can impact the brain. But over time, and you mentioned um, uh, adrenal fatigue here, that cortisol, it gets exhausted and the, the adrenals can't pump it out anymore. And then we have what we would call flatline cortisol, where there actually isn't enough to bring the inflammation down. Right, So we need healthy doses of cortisol to take inflammation down. This is why when we have an autoimmune condition that is flared in inflammation, and if you do go to, say, a hospital, they will often give you an injection of steroid, of corticosteroid, to give you a dose of cortisol in synthetic form to bring the system down. And sometimes we might need that if the symptoms are so severe. However, in terms of long view, long-term picture, we have to look at why is the system not healing and why is the immune system not able to produce its own chemicals. And so one of the um, key practices in Smart Body, Smart Mind is working with the stress organs. So the stress organs to me are the kidneys and adrenals, which pump out and are impacted by physiology that is on high, high alert, the gut, and how the gut connects to the brain. We have a very strong connection between the gut and the brain via something called the vagus nerve, which is our parasympathetic nervous system. We have the brain stem. Everyone say hello to the brain stem, which connects the brain to the spinal cord. And that is kind of like the seat of unconscious survival response. Um, we have areas around the heart that contract when we are in fear, in a bracing pattern. Um, and we also work with spaces of the body in Smart Body, Smart Mind that are a little tricky to get into, but think about it this way. When we are under threat, stress, when we are perceiving that we are in danger, our entire physiology and body system and tissues contract. They, in some ways, shrink. They get really small and tight, and it's a protection mechanism. So part of restoring the nervous system, part of getting this balance back and talking to these organs and tissues, part of this work is reestablishing safety and flow, and in many ways, loosening and opening up these spaces. Again, video number one, 
of the Healing Trauma series where I talk about the swimming pool and beach balls. That gets into that. Okay. Final one, Kirsty. All your questions are valid and they're going to inform, I think, other ones that I talk about. So just because I might not be answering your question, this is all valid and important. Um, but your final one is, I believe we are much more than our physical body. I agree as well. Does your method only focus on the physical or how is it holistic with respect to our energy body, our mind, our astral body, etc.? So I don't specifically teach about soul and spirit um, and this energy that, that we believe lives on when we die in our physical body. I believe that it exists. I believe in that element. Um, and we don't focus on it because we need to work on the physical first. And if it is in our mind and we know it's there, we can have that in our awareness and in our intention. But when we work with the physical body, the nervous system body, the thought-based body, all of this, it impacts the other elements that we would consider as human and universal energy. And um, I do in, in time and time again, every now and again, I'll insert some of these elements into the program, but they're not part of the curriculum. Um, and, and some of these practices are on being able to sense past, present, and future but we come at it from a sensory, visceral awareness to the environment level. So again, that element is on my radar, but we don't talk and teach about it. We work with levels of the body that are parallel to say the chakras in Eastern tradition, but I just don't call them that. I call them diaphragms, which is from the osteopathic traditions because that's what I was trained in. So I stay within my scope of practice, um, but we've also had, we've had um, a wonderful woman named Janet Raftus. I can get Crystal to pop up some of her um, videos. She did some talking with me and my team about how this program has helped her, her medium, her psychic intuitive practice. And a, a pra she's also a Reiki master. So she works with energy. She works with distant healing. She is a true psychic. And this has influenced and impacted her psychic abilities beyond belief because now her vessel, her physical vessel is healthy, regulated, and it's not trapping the old traumas. And a lot of folks who have very, well, I believe we all have psychic gifts. A lot of the reasons we don't have them is because our system is stuck in survival. It's kind of like um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you've ever heard of those, like first you need to make sure that you're fed and you have shelter. Then you have to make sure of the next thing and the next thing. And so our higher level as humans, this, these skills that a lot of people have that we, we would consider unnatural, they start to express when we're not living in survival anymore. And as a whole, we haven't really done that a lot. Um, so you might become psychic if you start this work in a good way. So you'll start reading people's minds. And that's what true empathy is, right? When we have a mother and a baby, she knows what it needs based on feeling its system through hers, through her gut, through her tissues. She feels what that child needs. So it is in us intuitively. We just separate the psychic realm from the physical. But really, good human relationship is about having that oozing empathy back and forth but also knowing this is mine and that is yours because a lot of people will say that they take on people's energy and it doesn't have to be that way. We don't need to shut ourselves off in order to survive with other humans. We just have to have really clear resiliency and boundaries and know this is mine, that's yours. And that's what happens when we become more intelligent, smarter in our body and mind. All right, I'm going to go back to the questions up here. Um, Elizabeth, let me read as I have a little drink here. You say two-part question. So have you worked or know of anyone who has been fully diagnosed with Addison's disease, who has been diagnosed with Addison's disease fully heal? So I don't ask my students to, to give me a laundry list of what elements they're healing. Um, sometimes we hear from people, but oftentimes we don't. I can't off the top of my brain 
remember Addison specifically. And I also know that there have been people that have healed from fibromyalgia and various other autoimmune conditions and hormonal imbalances. So I'll, that's how I'll answer that part. Excuse me. And then you say the Western doctors tell me it's something that you have that once you have, you have to manage for the rest of your life. I don't believe this, but haven't had a single other person that has said it's possible. I think it's possible. I think Addison's there's certain things that are purely genetic, like Down syndrome, certain blood defects that we're born with, clotting mechanisms, um, right? Uh, physical defects due to toxic exposure, children that were born um, through uh, mothers that were given thalidomide, which is you know horrific, but it happens. So there are certain things that may not be able to be structurally changed. Some might argue differently who know a bit more about the universal science, but for our purposes here, I do believe that some pretty severe symptoms and conditions can be healed. And I also think we have to be intelligent, right? If someone say, for example, um, has diabetes and needs insulin, I want that person to take their insulin, but I also want them to be able to work with their body and be intelligent with their body. Now, of course, if there's two different types of diabetes, but hopefully you get my drift there. So there's an interesting piece when we believe what the Western doctors say, because sometimes what they say is accurate, and I have to respect that. And a lot of them haven't seen what happens when we work at this level because it's not because they're stupid and ignorant necessarily. We just haven't had enough cases of people who have healed via this kind of work. I have met people who have recovered from cancers. Um, I've met people who have fully healed kidney problems. I'm thinking even about one of my mentors, Kathy Kane, was working with someone whose kidney stopped working. And while doing the stress organ work and working with the kidney adrenals, it started to come back online and it was deemed not functional. So I think there's a lot that we don't know, Elizabeth, um, and you need to feel into your own system what is true for you. And of course, be smart. And maybe you do use some Western medicine alongside of what I consider not West or Eastern, but just biological improvement in many ways, right? I believe in both forms of medicine and how can we bring them together? So you gotta, you have to listen into your own system and go from there. Um, coming into the questions here on the page. So your other question, Elizabeth, what would you suggest to someone who has Addison's and constantly going in and out of crisis but developed an allergy to the corticosteroids. I see. So you had a reaction to the 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 the, the drugs that they were giving you. So again, I, I wish I could say this is exactly what we have. You have to do. I can't do that. Um, definitely not over this forum. Um, but it's important to just know that all of us has it, all of us that we all have a nervous system and that nervous system connects to all of these organ systems the hormonal system especially and so when we can start to heal the stress responses maybe the traumas from taking or being given something that you had a reaction to um, that starts to take the grip off of that traumatic event and it's possible for the system to recover from that because I've seen it. It's also possible for the system to stay stayed and staying in that loop if we don't do anything to work with it actively. So again, um, it all comes down to the person. It all comes down to believing that this can change and then doing the work alongside of having medical um, not intervention, but medical observation and just being smart with, with your physiology and your doctors. Um, and then, of course, if you've had experiences where the doctors did something wrong or et cetera like that, um, know that there are ways to resolve that by finding physicians or medical professionals that actually can listen and can do it right. Um, 
So in terms of what you can stay out of immediately, if you can, if you haven't yet already, Elizabeth, be sure to do my healing trauma training. And in that, um, I offer out a 15 minute audio neurosensory exercise. It's very basic. It's not the full enchilada, but it can help to recenter and bring you back down to the nervous system level and just reconnecting to the environment. When we've had something that's occurred where there's been a reaction, um, the system is looking for that threat still. And so we need to tell the system there's no more need for that threat to occur or for that reaction, I should say, to occur. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of um, insight. I'm going to go on to some other questions here. But from the sounds of it, um, you're very keenly interested in this work. And so you got to follow your gut and you got you to sense what is it that your system needs and wants. And if it's feeling drawn to this work, then I would say go for it and give it a try. Okay, this is from, um, I don't have the name, it's Keen is the last name, I think. Um, so she writes, um, I'm 42 years old, and since the age of 14, I've been suffering with extreme blushing. Um, and so it looks like, I won't read the full thing, but you have spent many years trying to figure this out, close to 20,000 pounds, British pounds, trying to address this, these symptoms. Um, and I've devo developed a host of other symptoms over the years, and I'm completely exhausted. I eventually gave up work at age 35. I'm lucky and I'm supported by a loving husband. That is awesome. Um, but I admit I feel pointless, useless, and helpless all the time. I've been reading your material with a lot of interest, but I'm not sure if it would help me. Please advise. So blushing, so blushing, I think it's self-explanatory, but that is often what occurs when someone is in a stressful situation and they blush. So blood comes to the face and it, it basically shows bright, bright red um, and it can go you know, through here on the neckline and even the whole body. But what's occurring there is the system is going into a shutdown response. And so what it is, is the system, and I don't know your history, um, but chances are something occurred or there was early dysregulation and then maybe at that age you said of 14 there was some kind of event that was really big it doesn't have to be something that occurred to you it could have been losing a pet or seeing an accident that wasn't nice so underneath that there might have been already existing dysregulation video number one of the healing trauma series i talk about that so if you haven't watched that example i gave um, with two people who have a car accident that is exactly the same. One person walks, a, walks away just fine. The other person walks away and is undone and traumatized and starts to get symptoms, etc. I'd be curious to know if there was something underneath that was already a little fragile and dysregulated due to early circumstances that weren't good, stressful family life. Was there a medical surgery? Were you born premature? So what was occurring? And then was there something that occurred at that age that in some ways, uh, it's like the straw that broke the camel's back, that saying. So what happens is that the system will go into what's called a shutdown response, that freeze response. And we can function and be in the world, but have our overarching physiological response, the autonomic nervous system response, be more dominantly in this shutdown, freezy state. It's We would call it being in dorsal because it's the dorsal branch of the vagus nerve that is running the front of the show, so to speak. And so when that is there, the system starts to have this kind of and I don't know what you look like or what your posture is like, but it can be very kind of loose, very um, withdrawn, very uh, low metabolism. And then what occurs is that the blood vessels in the face don't have the pep. They don't have the ability to contract and have energy. And so they dilate, they get really big, especially when we're under even more stress and then that big dilation flushes the blood to the cheeks and then we get that really big blushing response. So blushing excessively is linked to this deep, deep freeze response. 
if we have that go over time, it would be linked with depression, with a condition like autoimmune, um, gut problems where the gut isn't working properly, it's not taking up nutrients, or there's maybe what we would call sort of an irritable, irritable bowel situation where there's this cycling of sympathetic, that fight flight, but then there's more parasympathetic dorsal shutdown that's basically saying to the system, we can't do this anymore, it's too much, so we're just gonna shut down and we're gonna have the blood vessels be open in the face area, right? The face has a very different, um, it has normal blood supply, but there's a lot of blood there. So that's what's occurring when there's massive blushing responses and it comes down to this, have you worked at this deeper nervous system level? Have you worked with the stress organs? My gut sense is you haven't, because most of you here haven't. This is very new work. We have to understand that the science, understanding how the nervous system works, these physiological responses of being trapped in survival, that science coupled with the research that shows when we don't heal that, we end up unwell later in life. It's called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. That study really put this work on the map and made us realize that these illnesses that people are having, autoimmune, fibromyalgia, heart disease, um, certain types of cancers, um, irritable bowel, Crohn's, addiction, there's a whole laundry list of them that all of these are connected to unresolved early traumatic stress. And as I said at the very beginning of this chat, if you're joining here a little late, just to remind everybody, we don't have to have had big blowout, big traumas. It can just be living in an environment that is a little unsafe and doesn't allow us to be who we are. And then slowly over time, we start to shut our system down because we have to. So, I understand that you're 100% exhausted and you've tried and spent, you know, over $50,000 US, you know, if I do the conversion uh, to try to fix this and heal this. And the question is, have you worked at this level? Um, it's a subtle level, but it's powerful and it takes time. And again, this is not me saying or discouraging people. It is not a quick fix working at this level. It requires layering the system, building capacity slowly so that the system gains its robustness and life force energy back organically, right? In order to shift the way in which the, um, they're called arterioles, the blood vessels in the face change, it can't just be done by going in and fixing um, them manually. Uh, I'm sure that there's some things that people do. You did, yeah, you wrote this. They're, they're, you're thinking of severing the nerves so that this doesn't occur, but there's serious side effects. Of course there's serious side effects because we need the nerves to our face to communicate, to feel. Um, so the, the restructuring, the wiring, the building back up of resiliency to these vessels and to the system takes time. However, when done well, and done in what I would call sequencing or neuroplastic healing, we're building back robustness to the whole system. Okay, I hope that I hope that answers that question. Um, I also want everyone to realize that what I just described for this symptomology of blushing is the same as healing a gut problem. It's the same as restoring more immune system health back to the, to the system. It's the same for improving cardiovascular robustness, so the heart being able to pump blood. Um, another common symptom when we have got unresolved trauma is not having our blood pressure rise and fall appropriately. Often it's switched, right? And it's switched because we have, again, I know I'm repeating myself here a bit, but we have that fight flight and those freeze responses. They're like having a chaotic heyday and they don't know when one should be on and one should be off. And that confusion is born out of this ongoing chronic stress, usually when we're young, where we don't know what, 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 what we should do. Example, you're brought up in a household that isn't safe. Your biology wants to hurt and scream and run away 
and be really mean to your parents. And some kids do that. Others don't. Most don't because they know if they do that, they risk more harm. They risk being kicked out. And it's just not nice to know that we're, you're going to get it back. And so the biology is driving this desire to fight flight. But then the freeze response is protecting this individual's sanity and life. And then you get these competing responses in there. And then that is what creates in some people these physical conditions, physical illnesses. In others, it creates mental illness because there is confusion and the person is trying to figure out with their mind, with their thoughts, what's going on in the physiology and it's just too chaotic and damn scary. And so there's a disconnection from the body and then that's where we get things like dissociation and dissociative identity disorder and various forms of um, other mental illnesses that I won't get into, but it creates this confusion, this chaos, and the internal, the internal landscape, if you will, the wilderness inside is terrifying to be with. And so we disconnect from it. And if we disconnect from it, we can't listen to it and give it what it needs. So a big part of this work is learning how to listen again to our system. Okay, went on a bit of a sideways uh, uh, explanation there, but I hope that is resonating. I'm going to get back to the comments here under the live feed. Adina asks, I've been diagnosed with type 1 autoimmune diabetes at the age of 39. I believe it's a result of my earlier experiences. High alert, always on, so something needed to give. You're correct. The body will say no, as one of my favorite authors, Gabor Mate, would say. Do you believe it could be reversed and healed? I believe a lot of things can be reversed and healed. You need to believe that it can be healed and you need to also be realistic to know how far along the body has gotten, how damaged is it. Um, and here's the thing, we won't know. I wish I could say with my magic ball that I don't have, crystal ball, crystal ball, yes, in two years and 20 days, this autoimmune condition will be completely gone. I can't say that ethically, and I, I can't because I don't know. I don't know you. I don't know your drive to do the work, to show up, to practice. We have to understand that, and I said this earlier, our potential as humans is not even realized right now. And these conditions that are popping up are because of, as you said, early experiences always being on, the system doesn't survive when it's living in survival. It gets broken down. So because this is fairly new working at this level, we are in a way figuring, in, figuring this out along the way. Adina, if you read some of the stories, I'm specifically thinking of Jane right now. If you look for Jane Eddington's story, on our registration page. I actually think Crystal, um, uh, my assistant Crystal is popping up links here for me when I need them. We have a blog post that Jane has her whole story. She came in and her bloods were off the chart. She had autoimmune markers. She had classic fibromyalgia and she healed it fully from just doing smart body, smart mind. And she was damn dedicated. She did the work. She didn't question it. She found a way to move forward, even if parts of her were like, what am I doing? She just went forward and did it. Um, so when I think of her and a few others that I think of when they share stories, um, I believe that a lot can be healed and it comes down to the person, not only believing it in themselves, but deserving it, feeling that they deserve it and giving it a try. Um, I actually met a, a one woman when I was in uh, Europe this fall teaching at one of my workshops and she had done smart body smart mind i'd never met her never seen her in our facebook group never asked a question on our forums and she said her whole life she's had this condition where when she gets stressed she blacks out and she has instant diarrhea like her bowels void like that so she couldn't go anywhere ever and it was debilitating as something like that would be 
that's an example. The, the blushing example I gave where the system is going into shutdown, that's another version of deep shutdown. The system is just letting go, literally, and passing out. Blood pressure drops. She doesn't do that anymore. It's completely changed, hence why she was at the workshop with me, with others for the three days that we were working together. So she was in tears and grateful and it was her that did the work. She showed up and did the work. I am merely the messenger right now. Um, so those are some stories. Um, and I like to have belief that everybody can heal and it's not for me to tell someone, yes, you will heal from this. It's for you to believe in yourself and then see the stories and then make a decision. I want to try this. I want to do this for myself. Let's see what happens. And so I know that might not be the definitive yes, this will. Um, that is my way of being respectful of you and your system. All of you listening to this, you have to make the decision for yourself and believe in your own system. Okay, I'm going to come back to the questions here. This is from Sophia. Hey, Sophia, I'm trying to see if this course is meant for me. I'm a graduate of um, IIN, which is the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, and you've studied the hormonal and gut courses. I'm looking for something in polyvagal health. I'm realizing that a lot of my clients are suffering from some type of anxiety that is contributing to their health problems, I think you meant to say. I would like to broaden my education on the nervous system. Will this course be able to teach me what I want to learn? 100% yes. Um, because you already are trained in integrative nutrition, you are working with people that are coming to you because they obviously have gut problems. What we know is that the gut is driven by the autonomic nervous system more so than the food. Now, of course, I'm being general there. If someone is eating a regular healthy diet of whole foods and they're still sick with their gut, chances are the nerve pathways that are connecting to the gut, specifically the vagus nerve, like you said, you want to learn more about polyvagal health, it is off. It's sending confusing signals to the system. The other thing with the gut is if we're living in survival mode and we're on that kind of fight, flight, freeze bus, and that's our world, when we go to sleep at night, we don't go into restorative sleep. And restorative sleep means that the nervous system specifically, and I'll give you a little bit of polyvagal science here, the parasympathetic nervous system, the branch that governs what's called low tone dorsal of the parasympathetic, this is what we get into in Smart Body, Smart Mind, the low tone dorsal branch, gear if you will, doesn't get shifted on. A person stays in what's called high tone dorsal. And when we're in high tone or if we're in sympathetic and we can't sleep, the system doesn't repair. And one of the repair processes that we want to have at night when we go to sleep, the true rest digest, is it does something called barrier keeping of the gut. You won't find that word in very many places. This is like gastroenterology science. So the study of the gut. But when we go into repair at night, we want our gut to repair, and it's called barrier keeping of the gut. If we don't go into restorative parasympathetic sleep that is low tone dorsal in nature, that gut will not get repaired, and that is what creates leaky gut. Everybody's gut breaks down in the day when we eat, and at night it repairs, just like our immune system is constantly fighting off bacteria and viruses and cancer cells. Whether or not we get sick or succumb to something is determined on how smart and how well that immune system is, for example. So the program will not teach you how to work specifically with trauma. It's not a certification program so that you can go out and do, say, what I do or my colleagues do, but it is going to give you high-level trauma-informed knowledge and the program is geared for you to do the work. So you are doing the work on yourself. You're learning the education. And what happens is when we become more resilient in our system and we can pick up and tune into all the stuff that's going on in our body, we become, as I said a moment ago to, um, it was Kirsty, 
our psychic capacity, our empathetic capacity to feel and know what other people need is sharp. And so if you work with people, it's like you'll become completely knowing of what you need to do to help these individuals. And then your training becomes robust and even more powerful. So um, yeah, I would say 100% this will help. There was a, um, Sophia, I have an interview with one of my students. He's a longtime student. His name is Mason. He is now a naturopathic physician. But when he first started Smart Body, Smart Mind, he was in school. And we talked to him late last year, so the end of 2018. He was just finishing up his board exams. I went to his graduation. It was super cool. But he can't imagine practicing naturopathic medicine without this knowledge because it's not taught at medical school, not yet at least. So yes, I definitely think this will shift and inform your practice and of course your own health, which is super important when we're working with people. I'm just looking here at the, the questions. Give me a second, you guys. Anne, I'm going to get to your question. So you say, I've listened to many hours of your webinars as well as Peter Levine, Stephen Porges, and Deb Dana, Dana, and more. All great people. Education and several practices have helped me grow capacity, and I see great improvement in my ability to regulate. That's awesome. I'm wondering if this course will be a lot of repetition of things I already know. I live most of my life in contraction or shutdown, and I've learned to function by excelling in control. Thank you for your honesty. Also, my therapist questions the online aspect of he th as he thinks I need more in-person work, and I've had challenges with, challenges with intimacy and vulnerability. Great question. So I absolutely say yes. This is going to give you new information. The reason I know that is some of my colleagues who are more trained than me, um, trained in other things, but they're trained in somatic experiencing, they're trained in the work of Kathy Kane, they understand the polyvagal lens. Um, many of them are somatic movement practitioners. They found huge benefit through Smart Body, Smart Mind because of the way I put together the information and the way in which the neurosensory exercises are taught. I have not found anyone to this date that teaches in the layered way that I do because of my background in the Feldenkrais method. I call it Feldenkraisian learning because of my background um, teaching science when I was in my 20s, um, working in fitness, working in nutrition. So I've got this lens that has bring, brought, brought together the work of Peter Levine, the work of Kathy Kane, and of course the work of Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais. So I do believe it will not be a repetition. Some of the basics, like if you understand everything about the polyvagal theory and you understand what high tone, low tone dorsal is, barrier keeping of the gut, all the words I just uh, expressed to talk about my last question that I answered, um, that might be review. And the bulk of the course, there, it's the practices. And the Feldenkraisian practices layer in the practices of Peter Levine and Kathy Kane, and I've put them together. Working at the stress organ level is very important. Um, and you said here you have challenges with intimacy and vulnerability. So that is a safety issue. Somewhere along the lines, it wasn't safe to express who you were um, for whatever reason, and I don't know your history, and that's fine. But working at the stress organ level, it gets into the cellular physiology. It reverse engineers our stress response. And so we are able to move our focus and attention to these various organ systems that are really uniquely poised around the work of Kathy Kane, which is somatic practice. Um, and you can't get that at this point anywhere else, unless of course you work with someone one-on-one. -on -one. Now, the online aspect, that's a completely valid question for your therapist thinking that it's not going to work online. Um, I have seen that the online format is highly beneficial when people have, um, at this point, the inability to be fully who they are and sink into their bodies when there's someone watching them. 
And I did a video on this last year called um, Can Online Healing Really Work? So Crystal's going to pop that up for me and you can watch that. Um, sorry, read that. It's an article. Um, because here's the interesting thing is if our trauma was relational, when we go into relationship and if we don't have the capacity to be with our sensations, emotions, if we override even the teensiest little bit, our system goes into survival. And so there's something quite beautiful when you can do this work in the comfort of your own home when you want. You can shut me up at any time and press pause if you're feeling a reaction. Whereas when you are with a practitioner and you've paid them the you know, $100 to $200 an hour that we charge for a touch session, if you have a reaction, which is part of the process, and you guys can only do five minutes of work, it, that doesn't work. And this is where our way of working one-on-one -on -one with people in an office, it's not lined up well for healing a lot of the early and developmental traumas because we might only be able to handle 10 seconds of work. When I was working with some of my chemical traumas in the classroom with, with my teachers, they couldn't even touch me. My, my system was so buzzed from my exposure to chemicals as a kid. The way I worked on it was at home by myself with um, in a bathtub. That's how we help heal a lot of fluid and chemical trauma. So I would say check out that article I wrote on online healing. Um, and I believe that this will give you elements that you've maybe never considered and haven't practiced. Um, we also get into working with healthy aggression. We cover so much that at this point, even um, my mentors aren't teaching in group format. So would love to have you if it feels right for you. Sandra says, I'm diabetic and use I've discovered other ways my glucose responds to hidden stress. It definitely can be. And, you know, of course, I'm not a medical doctor here, um, but I do know that um, one of our alum, alumni is type one diabetic and she takes insulin and I met her uh, this past year and she has said that if it wasn't for her, our course, she might not be here and alive just because she has found a way to be more intelligent in listening to her body and not pushing. And so you say there's this opposite response. I was talking about um, a few questions ago, the woman that was blushing and there being some people when they're deep in the shutdown response, the system flips. So rather than the heart rate and blood pressure going up when they exercise, it drops. And so part of my science brain is wondering if there is something occurring where your system is having the reverse of what it should have. And it'd be really fascinating to see if one were to help restore regulation to the nervous system and work with the stress responses. Ooh, I just got massive shivers up my head when I said that, Sandra. Um, so that was a big yes for me. There's something there that is telling me that there is a, ro a role reversal occurring where you're going to exercise and you want the sugar to be sucked up into the muscles, but it's staying in the blood and we want to shift that. Um, the other important thing for all of us, not just if we are living with diabetes, is muscle mass. We need to have muscle mass to soak up that sugar. So a lot of times um, exercise, we only talk about aerobic fitness, but it's actually very important for us to build muscle mass. I'm going to be, I think, talking a little bit more about that in the future because it's unknown to a lot of people. Okay. Um, there were a few other questions here around, um, one was from Sandra about, um, again, uh, I'm not going to read this all out because Sandra, hopefully by now um, you have gotten your answer, but you have a hereditary um, disorder that causes mast cell activation. So this is an immune response. Again, it kind of falls into that line of individuals that are living with, say, diabetes, not enough insulin, um, other forms of 
symptomology that is has a hereditary basis and at the end of the day we want to have the most robust nervous system that we can the most regulated nervous system that we can will that shift the dna i'm not sure i actually have a strong belief that we can change our dna but that is down the line because we first have to get out of our survival stresses and stay that way for many, many years as a collective so that our DNA can start to shift. And I know that might sound a little woo-woo, but there's, there's thought that we can shift our genetics by our way in which we nurture our system. There's that whole element of epigenetics. So epigenetics is that we have got predispositions for certain things and based on our environment, based on what we do, based on how we nurture ourselves, those genetic expressions will either be turned on or they turned on or they won't be. And um, it's important to just understand if you have a question around healing a certain illness or disease, again, this is not replacing medical advice and medical treatment. It is a complement to it. And what we've seen is that when people really become apprentices of their nervous systems and work with their systems and work on the traumatic stress that's sitting in their system, again, this goes back to that video number one, the healing trauma series, um, having these pool, these balls in our pools, um, the more we can take those out and the more we can build capacity in our system, the system starts to heal and do what it wants. And at the end of the day, it's important to also realize that our system doesn't want to be unwell. It takes a lot of energy when it's not well, when it's living in survival. So just know that the system is super intelligent and it is not intelligent when we're living in survival stress. It's common for us to think of diseases as just the norm. Oh yeah, I'm going to get this because my family had it. I, you know, these, these ways that we've seen humans, um, lose their lives or get sick as we age has just become accepted is that's what happens. I don't think that's the case. I do believe that we're not supposed to be unwell and have multiple wings and hospitals dedicated to different diseases. I think that's our current situation because we have been living in survival stress since we started to domesticate plants and animals and industrialize our situations here. Right. And if we listen and talk to some of the leading authorities, specifically Gabor Mate, one of them I'm thinking about, um, he would say that there's no more need to do any more research for healing illnesses, um, the ones that are chronic, because we know what causes them. And it is this unresolved, untreated traumatic stress that is in the system and it impacts all of the organs, all of the immune system, the gut the hormonal system and even how we relate to the world and others. So um, hello, hello people. I'm just seeing some other questions here. Serenity asks, do you have many successes with people who can't get away from their current traumatic situations? Yes, we've seen both. I've seen people who have ended really toxic relationships. I've seen um, people who are still dependent on their parents get out of their living situations. Um, I've also seen people fall in love and meet the loves of their lives, so it goes both ways. And it all comes down to um, what I mentioned a second ago when I was answering the question from someone, um, I forget who already, um, it, it comes down to your desire and your willingness to, to build the capacity to set the boundaries and to rewrite, in some ways, the future, right? And if we can really acknowledge the intelligence in our system and get back to it, um, we can do more than what we realize. And so one of the things that is often that often keeps people in traumatic, toxic situations is they don't have the capacity to work to set boundaries, to get out of the house, right? The capacity isn't there and the nervous system is still stuck 
in those survival responses. And when we are stuck in survival responses, we are magnets for more traumatic events. It's just the way it works because our ability to see things coming either metaphorically, energy, energetically, literally is not there. It's not as sharp. Um, so our ability to orient to our surroundings is very different when we are still stuck in survival stress and it puts us into this loop and the system likes the loop because it knows the loop. It knows that wiring. And so part of this work is really coming out of that loop and it's not always going to be easy. I'll be really uh, honest there. We're shifting patterns that for some of us we got before we were even born. And that means that the work takes time and it is very important work because we're literally stopping the historical trauma that we've been carrying with us generations and generations. And there was a question that someone asked um, whether or not this work can heal generational trauma. And the answer is yes, because um, everything that our ancestors have experienced and our parents it's somewhere within our system. And so part of working with that past is working with the present. But without getting into all of the stories and staying trapped in the past and in victim mode, but to be like, yep, that was the past and here is the future and this is my future and I'm gonna do what I want with it and I'm choosing to heal this way, for example. All right. Um, Thanks for your comments. Thanks, Crystal, for popping up the links. I'm just reading through here. Thank you for everyone being here. Okay. I'm going to go back to one question that was asked just a moment ago. And I do understand I'm not going to get to all of these. I'm going to keep doing Q&As. And I've read through all the questions, and if I didn't get to your specific one, um, I will get to more over the course of the week. You can always send us an email and ask for a written response, and we'll get back to you. And I hope you're starting to see that there is a pattern to what I'm saying here. Tell me if that makes sense. But this is a lifestyle shift. It is rewriting and apprenticing under our nervous system so that the systems that need the most help will get it. And so depending on if there's an illness, if there's a behavioral um, situation going on, if there's an addiction, um, trouble sleeping, the nervous system drives so much of this. It is not the full picture. We still need to eat and get vitamins and minerals. We still need to have movement and fresh air. Um, so we're assuming, I'm presuming, that the environment you're in is not toxic. Someone asked a question about mold. Um, and the, the thing is, is we want to make sure that we're not in a toxic environment anymore. And so the system, each system is going to be different. The more robust our nervous system is and the more resilient it is, the more we are able to take in exposures to things and our system process it and it releases it. Of course, there's a spectrum. Right? If we're exposed to really, really bad, say, nuclear fallout, that's a different situation. We're not meant to be exposed to that. Not that we're meant to be exposed to mold, but um, a lot of times when our system is dysregulated, it will be hypersensitive to uh, things in the environment. And so, number one, we want to get rid of anything that's toxic, but we also want to make sure that our system is robust so that we don't react to things that are maybe not life-threatening. Um, okay, so that, Angela, if you're still here, um, if you are here, know that it's something that we don't want to be exposed to, and the more your system can regulate and be resilient, the better we can cope and deal with these things that we come across from time to time. Um, this is from Anya, and she asked, could you please explain disgust as a form of high energy in the body? So this is the emotion disgust. You mentioned, mentioned it briefly in your last live stream a few days ago, but I can't perceive it as energy yet. This information was a total surprise to me. So yes, disgust is not something that we just start with in SBSM. I don't even work with it specifically in the exercises because it's such a unique 
emotion and it is one of the basic human emotions, but disgust is often connected with long levels, long standing shame, being shamed as a child, toxic shame, we would call it, or being shamed for something and then not having repair with our caregivers. So the disgust that we often feel isn't disgust for ourselves but it's disgust for what we had to put up with, what we were maybe subjected to, what we saw that wasn't nice. And there are many examples that I won't get into, but you can use your imaginations. And for those of you that have had various traumatic events, you may know what that feels like. The key to working with a lot of our toxic shame responses, which is often a sense of collapse, it leads to depression, things like fibromyalgia, autoimmune, so that level of high toxic shame is connected to these illnesses that pop as a result of unhealed traumatic stress. Disgust, as Peter Levine would say, is the gateway emotion to healing toxic shame. We don't want to feel disgusted towards ourselves. We want to feel the disgust of the situation and then do what comes up to make that move out. And that is one situation where I can't say, do this exercise so that you get that emotion out. The work that we do in SBSM is very different than a lot of other brain training techniques where they say, this is motion is connected to this, this pain is connected to that. It's too, we're too complex. We can't, it's not that cut and dry, which means this is why we're building capacity to be with everything that we're feeling with the lessons in the program it builds this foundation so that we have the knowledge so that when we do feel a sensation or an emotion or a strange movement or a bit of a trauma release we know exactly what's happening we aren't alarmed by it we aren't re-triggered by it um, and we just move through it as opposed to maybe missing it and not even knowing that it's there so Big part of this is becoming more intelligent, hence why the program is called Smart Body, Smart Mind, so that when there are elements moving through, we have not only the capacity to be with what's there and stay connected to our body and the environment, but we can name it and say, oh, this is that thing that Irene was talking about. Oh, I feel that disgust, and that's okay. I'm moving something out. So. I'm glad that, Sandra, your question was answered. Cool, cool. Um, and Summer, I did not answer your question about DNRS and the limbic system retraining. There is actually a thread in our Healthy Nervous System Revolution Facebook group that talks about this. Um, and I do need to go because I have another call coming up. So I'm going to end in a few minutes here. But um, from what we've seen, I have clients and students that have gone through those programs, um, specifically that one, um, and they've not fully healed. And when I say fully, I know I don't, you know, I can't predict but it's not getting into the stress physiology the way we need to from what I've seen in my practice. So we're not just working with the, the thoughts. We're not just working with um, specific emotions. We're working with the whole organism, the whole kit and caboodle, so to speak. And so um, again, I'll just speak to, I haven't done the program myself, but I know people that have and there's a reason they came into SBSM because they needed a more holistic approach. They needed to work with the trauma responses. They needed to understand how the traumatic stress, it isn't just in the brain and in the mind. It is in the heart. It is in the gut. It is in the immune system. It is in the joints and diaphragms of the body. It's in our movement patterns. It's in how our posture is. It's in how we relate to the environment, how we see it or don't see it. So, Again, um, I haven't done these programs specifically, but from what I've heard, they don't have the full picture involved. And so Smart Body, Smart Mind is really getting into this full picture. So if you want to go over and see some of the conversations, it's in the file section. If you can't find it, just let us know and we can post that to you. But it's about um, those specific programs and also um, another program called the Gupta program, which 
is specifically designed for fibromyalgia. So again, SBSM is not about fixing or healing just one thing. It's about restoring health and regulation and resiliency to the entire system via this lens of the nervous system and via practices that are engaging the body, the attention, the awareness, movement, et cetera. So I got I to gotta run, guys. Um, and gals, thank you for being here and asking your questions. Um, I hope this has been useful. I hope this has given you a little more insight. As I mentioned at the beginning, we only do Smart Body, Smart Mind once a year. Registration is open through till next Sunday, the 1st. If you know you want to do this and you have an impulse, get in today, start with the pre pre-program materials, get familiar with everything, and then we start on the 2nd with orientation week. Um, so far, we've had people from 47 countries, 47 countries go through this. This isn't um, just a little experiment. We've seen that this works. We've seen people shift massive things in their lives, in their health, in their health, and how they parent, and how they relate, and how they do their careers. So again, it's about becoming your own medicine, becoming an apprentice, apprentice to your nervous system. Um, so have a look. Read through the comments. Um, on our registration page, read some of the success stories, get to know some of our alumni. If you have any questions about specifics, send us an email, support at irenelion.com. We'll be happy to answer them. You can also ask us specific questions in my Healthy Nervous System Revolution Facebook group. There's a specific thread devoted to SBSM, so look for that. Um, and we're here to answer your questions and just tell you, tell, tell it like it is. Um, so thanks everybody. I will sign off now and maybe, maybe we will see you in Smart Body, Smart Mind when we start up on the 2nd of March. Bye-bye.